President Putin advised his leaders of military to be on standby with nuclear weapons. Many of us may not even understand the gravity of what a nuclear war could mean. I was doing some research and found out that a nuclear war is probably the only thing that America can't stop. Have you ever heard of the phrase mutually assured destruction? So is this the time to start stocking up on food, bottled water, and prepping for the worst case scenario? Or do we sit back and act like nothing's happening and ignorance is bliss? Bruce Lawn. Is nuclear war an option? We're gonna be talking about this with regards to all the Putin stuff and everything that's happening in Ukraine. And just so you guys know, the situation with Ukraine, it is complicated. It goes back decades. It goes back to the Soviet Union. It goes back to Putin low-key wanting to be with the in crowd by wanting to be a part of NATO in like 2000s when he was talking to Bill Clinton and then uh, he kind of got slighted and he kind of feels away. And then everybody's like, Ukraine, you should be a part of NATO. And then Putin's like, what are you talking about? There's already other nations and they're going further and further east. I don't like it. And so he put, put, puts, puts his chest out and then Ukraine's like, oh yeah, I got my homies with me. And then they're like, no, 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 you're not going to act all tough with us, bud. We'll end you. And then Putin, uh, I think, overcalculates his hand, invades Ukraine, and then as of recently makes this statement about getting his military arsenal ready, which puts, puts the whole thing is, is really wonky. And so I'm going to show you guys a clip and I got some passages for you that I, in my opinion, if you watch till the end, will ease some of your tension with regards to this whole conversation because it is a tense conversation. A lot of people are freaking out. And so let's just jump this in. So I, I recommend breaking points. Okay, they're not perfect. However, they are uh, balanced in my opinion and they are independent, meaning they're not state funded, they're not government funded, and they're not privately funded like CNN, Fox News, MSNBC. They are funded by us, by me. I'm a, I give every every month, I give them 10 bucks a month because I want to see what they're doing. They've been growing aggressively. So this is Crystal Sagar. And they're gonna talk about this, unpack this whole nuclear war thing in a way that's way smarter than I could because they actually live in this ecosystem. So let's listen to what they have to say and then I'm gonna give you guys some passages. Check this out. Speaking of that, um, nuclear war, which is something that I obviously am probably the most worried about. Yesterday I said it was around 1%, maybe higher than 1%. And look, I think that probably is still true. Uh, that being said, that's really high, actually. And this is still very scary. Now, President Biden- So he said nuclear war, 1%. But that's actually still pretty high. So listen to what he says next. It's about this yesterday at the White House by a reporter. He's trying to calm people down. Here's what he said. Mr. President, should Americans be worried about nuclear war? No. So the president says no. That's good news. We are trying to de-escalate. We seek no flies. No, there is no no fly zone. We are not engaging with Russia. They say that U.S. nuclear posture has not changed. Um, Look, really what it is, is that we need to not just look at our country, but theirs and how they are thinking about nuclear weapons. You alluded to this in the last block. So why is this important? Well, because the president of Ukraine, who by all accounts has really been brave and courageous in the situation. And I, and I do believe Ukraine uh, from the work that my buddy Vlad has done there, who's from Ukraine. Um, I believe Ukraine is a spiritually alive country. There are a lot of believers there. There's a lot of revival there. And in that, um, the president is being very brave, very courageous, but he's leaning on the West and specifically uh, the NATO alliances to create a no-fly zone, which could, could have really damning implications for this entire situation and could potentially lead to like an actual war outside of just Ukraine and Russia, other people getting involved, right? We're already funding the Ukrainians. We're already sending them weapons and resources. And so it, it could really make things more tense. So this is from Pravda uh, and it was written in English. Now, the reason why it's very important is that this is a perfect view into kind of the most hawkish view within the Kremlin. And here's what he says in terms of the red button. Is Mr. Putin putting his nuclear forces on high alert a distraction? Is he bluffing? Here's what this columnist writes in Pravda. Unlike his predecessor, Mr. Putin is unlikely to surrender Russia again. He's talking about Mikhail Gorbachev to liberal ideologies and Wall Street capitalists. Bo a little bit of context on Putin. Putin was a part of the KJB. He transitioned into post-Soviet Russia. They weren't a, a fan of how initially Russia transitioned. The little red buttons may seem the only viable alternative to a humiliating defeat and becoming another economically pun plundered satellite of the West, as happened to those countries who recently suffered the same fate in the Middle East. So those are Rus Russian people writing in English to understand their thought process. An entirely possible scenario is that Russia will itself end the war through negotiations, yet not before, listen to this clearly, destroying the limited capabilities of the Ukrainian army and causing severe damage to its infrastructure. 
Okay, so Rush is like, oh, and what? But first, we're going to do a lot of damage. This is really dark. Electricity, water, food supply chain, leaving an already economically declining West to pay for rebuilding while sending a very clear message to NATO and those countries allowing it to happen to keep away from Russia's borders, which incidentally is what all of this was about in the first place. The alternative scenario is frightening. Again, a threatening of nuclear war. And he says this in conclusion, the Russian response will have shocked both NATO and Western politicians as any bullies. They will now retire to lick their wounded pride, stick their tongues out, as will the indoctrinated denizens of Western social media with the three second attention span like of a goldfish. <laughs> <Ukrainian> <laughs> <laughs> soon for if there's one thing that my Russian people know how to do, is they, they know how to clap back at you filthy Americans. You, you're, you have the attention span of a, of a goldfish. You don't understand what you're dealing with when you're talking to Mother Russia and all of the tensions that are happening here. You don't know. Well, yeah. Next, climate extinction scare emerges or iPhone announces its new upgrade. Man, sometimes you know it's pretty well. <laughs> I gotta say. Hold on, you got <laughs> These fools are wild. The Russian response will have shocked both NATO and Western politicians as any bullies. They will now retire to lick their wounded pride, stick their tongues out, as will the indoctrinated denizens of Western social media with the three second attention span like of a that. goldfish. <laughs> Ukraine is soon <laughs> forgotten as the Had next there. climate extinction scare emerges or iPhone announces its new upgrade. Man, sometimes. As, as you wait for the new iPhone, and, and you're concerned about gender bathrooms and climate change. We will end you, American crazy. Right? <laughs> like, that's the time that they're on, bro. It is. Yeah, so, let, so let, I'll play a little bit of this, and I'm going to give you guys some verses. The legitimate view within Russia, and specifically within what is allowed to come out in English at this crisis. And that's important for us to read. And we need to understand that they're not bluffing whenever it comes to the use of nuclear weapons. There is no such thing as a small nuclear war. We have understood this since the 1950s when they're like, hey, you should use nukes in Laos or in Vietnam. And Eisenhower's like, what are you crazy? He's like, no, we're not doing that. And there was an explicit admission by Robert McNamara in the Kennedy administration that any exchange of nuclear weapons leads to almost full scale nuclear hol holocaust of the entire human race, if not just at least the uh, Russian public and the American public, the deaths of hundreds and hundreds of millions of people. And and when you have this cavalier attitude inside of the Kremlin, and let's not whitewash, we have a cavalier attitude in the United States. We have elected politicians, Adam Kissinger and Robert, uh, Roger Wicker, advocating then for a no-fly zone. Yeah. These are real consequences, the likes of which we have not seen, I don't know, 40 years, 50 yeah. years. Berlin crisis and the Cuban Missile Crisis are probably as close as it yeah. And then these little glimpses that we have into Ru what Russian state media is saying as well provide a little bit of a window. Um, yesterday, we brought you the uh, Russian state TV mm -hmm. presenter who was basically saying, right. like, it's not worth being in the world if Russia's not in it. Uh That's scary. So this extremely nihilistic, like, you know, it, we we're willing to just take this whole place down if we don't get what we want out of this situation or if we mm -hmm. feel too humiliated by it. I mean, that language comes up a lot, too, this idea of, of uh, being humiliated by the West. And I think, you know, some of the, the things that we're seeing now and the efforts to completely cut them off in the global financial system plays into those fears of them being this sort of like hobbled, humiliated state once again. Example number one is this is definitely make Russia great again, nationalistic rhetoric. Absolutely. Another example is Russia feels like the uh, teenage kid who unloaded a clip at his school. They feel like they've been bullied. They feel like they've been backed into a corner. They feel like they've been humiliated. And this slightly off their rocker. There's some things happening there mentally. And so they're they're willing to lay it all down. If, if they can't exist the way they want to exist, they'd rather not exist at all. And they're okay with taking people down. These are real legitimate, like serious threats and consequences. Now, um, how am I personally processing this having came and experienced a former Soviet Union as a child and now I'm in America and I see the, the, the vast contrast of ideologies. And here we have different issues, just so you guys know. Here, because we have it so good, because we have it so good, we then create existential problems that they're not really problems. We're arguing about bathrooms and pronouns and all kinds of nonsense. When there's folks really experiencing serious issues uh, abroad, when there's people really like experiencing lack of food, shelter, water, and we in, in the West kind of argue over dumb stuff, which would, is actually a great time to attack if you think about it. They're problems, but they're first world problems. And that's what we're dealing with. And then you have people that are really dealing with different types of problems and different types of thinking. These are people that are coming from a different ideology that are willing to lay it all down. And, and it's a really, um, it's a tense situation. And so how do I process this as a follower of Jesus? There's two passages. 
The first passage is is a psalm from David, and David is writing in this chapter, and David was going through it, man. David had a specific calling, and he knew what he was going to become since he was a child. However, he was on the run, and he was getting persecuted, and he was going through it, you know, but, but his faith in the Lord remained, and he remained steadfast on this truth right here that I want to read to you guys. This is Psalm chapter 24. Psalm chapter 24, verse 1 and 2. It says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Okay, then it says, Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. Okay. So here he's opening with this massive idea that like, listen, through trials and tribulations, I I have to remind myself constantly that ultimately God is on the throne. That doesn't mean we're relinquished the responsibility and we don't have anything we got to No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying at all. It ultimately means that God is on the throne, that Jesus is on the throne, that God is sovereign. God is good. God is ultimately over it all. And even in the bad things that happen, God has to allow those things to happen. And ultimately in Romans 8, it says that all things will work for good for those who uh, love God and are called according to his purpose for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. God is on the throne. He's reminding himself of this, right? And then he says, who, who, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall be able to, to, to draw near to God in the midst of the chaos? Who shall stand in his holy place? Because remember, God is a holy God. We're a, a sinful people, right? We, there's a disconnect. That's why Jesus had to come. Okay, because we are sinners and we're jacked up and we've made bad decisions. We've been put into environments that aren't always allowing us to make good decisions. We've fallen short of God's desire, his, 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 his calls for us. We've overtly broken commands. So he's saying, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? Um, verse four, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, And does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. All right. So that's, I believe, a promise for a lot of us here today. Don't don't become a geopolitical expert. Don't 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 jump into the web of the latest conspiracy theory that you read on Instagram. And now you know everything about it. No, 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 no. Don't do that. I got another passage for you guys. Excuse me. Second Timothy. He says to him, verse eight. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. This is, again, the church is going through it right now, okay? Verse 9, who saved us and called us to a what? Here's that word again. A holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Okay, so there it is again. So it's not that you're saved by works. You're saved because of what Jesus has done on the cross. He gave us his his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before. And then it's verse 10. And which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The gospel, the good news. Christ has done it all. The verse I really want want us to think about here is this verse right here. Verse 6. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Okay, so fan into flame the gift, the gift, the grace which God has given you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. We can go down the, the eschatological rabbit hole. We can go down what latest thing is it, is it pre-trib, is it post-trib, is it a literal rapture, is it this rapture, is it that rapture? Here's the issue with all of that. It doesn't negate that in this space and time, regardless on what's happening out there, which you can't control anyway, you are to fan into flame the gift. You are to remind yourself of the grace You are to walk in the the purpose that God has for you, irrespective of what the outside world is going on, okay? The world is a dark and chaotic place, friends. It is is not all peaches and roses. However, we're commanded (laughs) to not be ashamed. We're commanded to fan into flame the gift of God, 
Okay? For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God. When I'm afraid, and this, I'm not saying like it's all peaches right now. It, this should just remind you, especially since the, you know, the, the panoramic to now, this should remind you how fragile and how dark the world really is. But what I do is I go, what is the worst case scenario here? Worst case scenario here is no, nuclear war. Pretty scary stuff. What is the worst case scenario with that? We all die. Okay, we all die. Guess what that means? I get to go home. I get to go to heaven, be with Jesus. That's the worst case scenario. None of that changes about what I'm supposed to do in the interim, which is fan into flame the gift, which is not be ashamed of the gospel, which is be willing to suffer, which is lead my household, which is love God and love people. Our application of, of, of these passages doesn't change whether times are good or times are bad. You're still called to live on alert. You're still called to be, to be prepared. You're still called to love people. That's good news. And it's all afforded to us because of Jesus. Because Jesus came, lived the life we couldn't live, died the death we should have died in our place on the cross, rose on the third day, and then sent his Holy Spirit so that we would be transformed on this side of eternity and get to spend an eternity with him in the, in, in the afterlife. So the worst case scenario is still a W. The worst case scenario is we get to go to, uh, get the glory, to go, go to glory. But my opinion, I don't know. I, I don't think God's done yet. I'm praying for a peaceful resolution. I'm praying that tempers would, 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 would simmer down. I'm praying that men would be wise. I'm praying that God would get the heart of all the leaders because I don't think God's done yet. I think God still wants to redeem and, and rescue a lot more people and reveal himself to a lot more people, reveal Jesus to a lot more people. And I think God may want to use me and you and whatever means we have available to us to do that. And in the process, <laughs> We got to make sure that our house and our mind and our heart and our mentality is in order. We do not have a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Regardless of what's going on out there, your life as a follower of Jesus doesn't change. The variables don't change. Your sanctification and your cooperation and what was the last thing God told you to do hasn't changed. Still the same thing. Still called to do the same thing. If you're married, still called to love, live on your, love on your wife the way Christ loved the church. If you're a husband, you got a father, still called to be the pastor, the priest, the protector, the provider of your home. Could things get worse? Yep. Could things, could, could, could it get dark? Yep. Could, could this be massive revival that breaks out? Yep. We don't know. So you worrying and being concerned about stuff that you can't control anyway what good is that doing you? What you think about is going to determine the beliefs you have. The beliefs you have is going to determine the way you behave. So I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. I don't, I don't believe God's, God's done yet. And, it, and if I'm wrong and things go really dark, man, you know what? It's okay. God, God's, God's, God's on the throne. Jesus is on the throne. Jesus is still king. Like, guys, the, Jesus said we were going to experience trouble. Jesus said that things were going to be hard. The last two years of that became a reality call for a lot of us. I'm sitting here like, fam, I remember what it was like lining up for rations. That's how the food came out in, in, in the Soviet Union. Right? Sometimes going without food. Sometimes having your bodily, physical harm to, to your body and, and, and to people you love. Why? Because of some weird ethnic cleansing and, and, and some stuff that was just over my head as a child. But I remember this stuff. The world's a, a, a serious place, friends. It could get real. It could get dark really fast. Okay, so I say all this to say, don't be afraid. Don't fear. God's got it. You do the last thing that you believe the Lord told you to go. And stay prayed up. Stay in your scriptures. Get into a local church. Get into a community. Fill your mind with things that are going to build you up and not things that are going to make you more afraid. Listen to some... Worship music, it's okay to listen to some worship music and worship Jesus. Does it make you more emotional? Does it make you weak? Right? Like, like meditate your mind on these things. So anyway, those are my thoughts. Let me know what you guys think. Kingstream Entertainment.
Bruce Lawn. Yo, thank you so much for making it to the end of the video. Be sure to check out some of the links in this description. We have a free Master My Devo course that I put together and a free Master My Habits course that I put together with my Christian therapist, Dr. Rudy, helping you to create freedom forming habits. All that's in the description. And be sure to check out some of these other videos from me and YouTube recommended to you. All right.